singing, storytelling, inspiring great and noble deeds, but rarely doing the fighting themselves, bards are a staple of fantasy fiction and games. While musicians have entertained nobles and royalty since ancient times, the bard as we understand it today, a lute, toady, minstrel, and tights, is largely a product of the early Middle Ages with origins rooted in the Celtic courts of the British Isles. In those days, bards served their noble patrons by aggrandizing their achievements in word and song, while belittling their enemies using the same weapons. To use the terminology of modern games, they buffed their allies while debuffing their enemies. They were poets and storytellers, composers and singers, and, given the strong oral tradition of the day, not that far removed from actual historians. I can't play an instrument and I'm long removed from my choir days, but I can give you some insight into the real-life history of bards, where they came from and the kinds of powers they reportedly possessed, which might give you a notion of how the bard was adapted for modern fantasy works. Even though we tend to associate bards with the medieval period, they were not completely unknown even in the time of the Romans. Writing in the 1st century AD, the poet Marcus Aeneas Lucanus made note of bards in Gaul or modern-day France. While the Celts of that region would later be wholly subsumed into the empire, their cousins across the English Channel did a better job of preserving their culture even through centuries of Roman occupation. The British Isles are considered the true birthplace of bards, who, alongside the Druids, filled a vital role in society as inspirational leaders of early Celtic tribes and kingdoms. But historical bards were just musicians, right? Sure, they might have entertained and boosted morale, but they left the actual great deeds to the warriors who surrounded them, didn't they? From a realism standpoint, yeah, that's probably what happened. But when you look at what's been written about bards in history, you'll find an array of magical talents that would make even Merlin jealous. And you might even find Merlin himself. Some of the most famous historical bards whose names we know were from Wales, and lived around the 6th century AD. Probably the most well-known of these early bards was Taliesin. The Book of Taliesin was written over half a millennium after his death and contains several poems purported to be composed by the man himself. These include works praising King Urien of Regid and bemoaning the loss of the king's son Owain, while other tales refer to two other kings, Brewild Uskethrog and Cunan Garduin of Powys, which would indicate that Taliesin was well regarded enough to be employed by three rulers. Little is known of Taliesin outside of his work, but in true bardic fashion, legends have sprung up regarding his life. Some are vaguely plausible, like Talies in predicting the death of a king or using a wooden shield as a boat to escape pirates. Others grant him magical powers, like being able to shapeshift after accidentally drinking a magical potion brewed by the legendary witch Caridwen. To hide from a vengeful Caridwen, Talies in transformed into various animals, and when that didn't work, made himself into a piece of grain which Creed went eight, eventually somehow giving birth to Taliesin, who was so beautiful she couldn't bring herself to harm him. So yeah, that allegedly happened. But hey, maybe this explains why bards get polymorph as a fourth level spell in Dungeons and Dragons. Or maybe he was just an especially charismatic wizard in general? Dig further down the rabbit hole and you find some sources who claim that Taliesin possessed vast magical powers and was employed not only by historical kings, but by the legendary King Arthur. In other words, Taliesin is sometimes equated with Merlin. Like Taliesin, Anarin was a Welsh bard active during the 6th century AD. As it was a book of Taliesin, there's also a book of Anarin written several hundred years later. That book contains the epic poem E. Gedothan, which eulogizes the brave Rathonic men of the Kingdom of Gedothan near the modern border of Scotland and England, and their quest to recapture the stronghold of Ketreth for the Anglo-Saxons. Here's a snippet of that poem. 300 gold torqued men attacked. Guarding their land bloody was the slaughter. Although they were slain, they slew. And until the end of the world, they will be honored. And all of us kinsmen who went together, sad but for one man, none escaped. Pretty inspiring words, I'd say. But did he say there were 300 warriors who set out to defend their homeland and perished in the valiant attempt? Why does that sound familiar? Like Taliesin, Anarin also has a link to King Arthur. A stanza of Egadothan says that one of the doomed warriors, quote, was no Arthur, which leads you to think that Anarin's audience would have been familiar with the legendary king. Arthur's historicity is a matter of debate, so maybe this would be like a modern text comparing a real person to Superman, 
a reference that today's readers would understand, but whose context might be lost over the span of a thousand plus years. Ireland also has a strong bardic tradition, which you can see by looking at all the harp designs representing the country on flags both real and fictional, not to mention the logo of a particularly well-known brewer that got a start in Dublin in 1759. Back in 1185, on a trip to the island, the Royal Clerk of England, Gerald of Wales, called the Irish truly barbarous in all their habits, but was still impressed by their musical talents. The only thing to which I find that this people apply a commendable industry is playing upon musical instruments. They are incomparably more skillful than any other nation I have ever seen. The most famous Irish bards are mythical figures, entangled in the origins of the Irish people themselves. They probably didn't exist, but they did have some fantastic powers that would make any adventurer jealous. Cairbre Mac Edwine was purported to be the son of a god, and his scathing mockery of a king led to calls for his abdication. Much later, he was made into a Marvel Comics character using the name Caber, able to run at hundreds of miles per hour and lift 35 tons. Who says bards are skinny, low-strength wimps who can't fight? Then there was Cru Dei Rioil, the dwarf son of a god who could put people into a magical sleep with his music, and the Mergeng Luingil, who countered a storm raised by hostile druids to allow a friendly landing force to reach shore. There was at least one historical bard from the era, Mongan Macfiachna, an Irish prince who died in the early 600s. While he was a real person, he was also attributed fantastical powers, like shapeshifting and prophecy, not unlike Taliesin of Wales. Post-medieval times, the term bard has been broadly applied not to just musicians, but to many talented poets and writers. You've probably heard William Shakespeare referred to as the bard, and go a little further north and you have Robert Burns, known as the National Bard of Scotland. Thankfully, the only spells these men weaved were to enthrall readers with their words or viewers with their performances, though one did exhibit remarkable talent despite a major physical disadvantage. Turlo O'Carolan lived from 1670 to 1738 and spent nearly half a century traveling throughout Ireland making a living with his harp. In all, over 200 songs are attributed to the man whose memorial in St. Patrick's Cathedral refers to him as the last of the Irish bards. His itinerant life would have been extraordinary enough even without the addition of one significant detail. From the age of 18 onward, Caroline was blind. If he'd been born a thousand years earlier, it's likely that he too would have been granted a fantastic origin story and magical powers to overcome his disability. So as you can see, the prototypical bardic adventurer has a solid root in history and myth, both as a figure that inspires greatness in others, as well as being skilled in the more subtle arts of magic. In most games, bards don't sling fireballs or stand in the front lines of battle, but work from the rear, and when called upon to personally take action, usually achieve their goals via trickery or illusion rather than brute force. That meshes well with the more fantastical tales of bards from historical and pseudo-historical records. Whether it's Taliesin's or Mongan's shapeshifting or a crew's sleep spell, bards use finesse where others might go for a direct approach. Again, this fits the historical narrative. A real bard might not have had any true political power, but given their position in court as an entertainer and propagandist, they still could have influenced events indirectly. Keep that in mind the next time you play a bard. You might not be the strongest or the swiftest, or have the most powerful magic, but if you make the rest of your party look good, they'll be glad to have you. And if they don't properly appreciate you, here are some choice insults from Shakespeare you can use. Thank you everyone for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, click those like and subscribe buttons, and leave a comment letting me know what aspect of gaming you'd like me to dig into the real history of. Till next time!